And when I was presented with the idea of, of doing a topic um, in, in hip replacement, um, I thought best what, uh, you know, what, what, I, what I could explain. And I thought that giving the patient or the attendees today an idea of exactly what a hip replacement is and, and where we've come and a lot of the advancements that we've made to give you a good outcome, um, I thought that that would be the most valuable, valuable thing that we could look at. So having a better understanding of what you're going to go through, uh, I think improves your chance for success because um, our relationship in, in the operating room is about two hours, but there's so much more before and after that goes into that success to getting you a good outcome. Um, and I think that when the patient has an understanding and they're involved in their care, they're going to do better. So with a joint replacement and today specifically hip replacement, what we're looking to do is one, improve your pain level or take it away com uh, completely. But the most important part of that is it allows you to have more function, restoring you to activities that you enjoyed um, even months or, or years ago that uh, kept you healthy, uh, both uh, body and mind. Um, <clears throat> it also today hopefully is uh, prepares you and gives you an idea what a hip replacement surgery is and, and what it entails. So we'll start off, you have to understand where we where we start with uh, the natural anatomy of of most humans and why that is so important to the hip replacement is because we affect it no matter what type of approach or what type of hip, hip implant we do for you you're going to have a, a disruption of of what you have now okay and we have to make sure that we put this hip replacement in a way that optimizes your outcome so the hip joint itself is surrounded by what we call a capsule, and that capsule is made up of uh, a variety of ligaments. Actually, the, the red ligament that you see on uh, the, the picture to your left, that's the strongest ligament in your body, the iliofemoral ligament. Um, and so uh, approach is a common topic in terms of hip replacement, but so no matter how we do the approach to the hip, these ligaments are, are moved or, or retracted in a way that we have to make sure that they're appropriate. Here's a look at the inside of the hip, okay? So you can see that the bone on the left and right side of the screen is your acetal acetabulum or your pelvis, and then there's the femoral head right in the middle. Uh, our native anatomy, what do we have? We have a, um, the, the cartilage of the joint, uh, both in the top, the, the front and the back, um, and then there's the, the labrum or that pink ring of cartilage that you see there. Those are for, the, the labrum is for the stability of the joint, okay? Now that's removed during your surgery, so we have to make sure that we increase your stability with other ways in the way we uh, put the implant in and what we'll talk about. Um, and obviously, if we're talking about arthritis, we're talking about that cartilage being gone or, or significantly affected. Here's another picture, that number one there, that's your bone. That number three uh, is the labrum, and number two is the cartilage, and the, the intimate relationship they have with each other and, and how they're changed during surgery. Here's a look at uh, the actual pelvis. Uh, these are called your anonymous bones. You have two of them. Uh, and so the, the spine has a connection to these bones right in your back by your sacrum, and they're stressed in a way that they form what we call columns of the anterior and posterior part of your pelvis. And that is the bone where we put the cup portion uh, of a hip replacement in. And that's our connection to the lower legs. Not everybody's the same. Everybody has a different morphology or how their, their bones are formed or how they look. And so we have to take that into consideration too. And these are just some examples of the different uh, ways that the hip can look uh, in terms of the angle of the, the femur itself or the, the pelvic bone and the different considerations that we take. Most importantly is disrupting at least amount of the natural anatomy as possible. Two of the most important muscles and really the key function of the hip is driven by these two muscles. One's called your gluteus medius and the other one is called your gluteus minimus. Okay, these are connections between that pelvis and the top of your femur bone. And I'll show you why they're vital to making sure that they're, they're optimized and they're positioned appropriately for a hip replacement. 
So what is abduction? Abduction is approximating that top part of the femur or the greater trochanter to the ilium. I'll give you two examples here in the, the slideshow. One is sometimes we lift our leg out to the side like that. You can see how that femur is getting closer to the pelvis. Another way we do this is we bend. So we bend our pelvis and get it closer to that femur. Those aren't common motions. Sometimes we do them, but it kind of leads me into the other position is we walk and every, everybody is in walks in one form or another. And so when we walk, we briefly get onto one leg. And so why are those muscles so important for function and for the hip replacement itself? This gentleman is standing on his left leg. You could see how his body weight wants to take him towards the center of his body and he would fall because his, his other leg's not on the ground. So what gives that, that pelvis stability is that muscle pulling. So when we look at this, we can see the blue is normal. So uh, this one is, the, the patient is on their right leg. And so instead of falling, that muscle will tighten and pull that pelvis so it's level. So when we walk, there's not a tip or, or um, a, uh, a movement of the pelvis that's inappropriate. You can see when that muscle is not functioning properly for whatever reason, we get a dipping of the pelvis to, to one side, okay? Another way that this plays into it is when the patient has a painful hip, a way that we cause less uh, weight across the hip is we actually start to limp. It's not, and we do it subconsciously. And so limping, the reason we limp is to take off more pain from that painful joint that you're experiencing, okay? And I'll explain as we go here why limping actually causes less pain, but ultimately it's not gonna take away uh, the symptoms that you have, and obviously nobody wants to limp. This is really important, and this kind of plays into to the hip replacement and that role of those muscles we talked about in your body weight. So if we look at uh, this hip here, this is a, a replacement. And so the middle arrow is the resultant joint force. So you think about that leg and all that force is going through this small area. And this, I, I always think of this and explain it as a, a seesaw. And we want that seesaw to be balanced. So we can see on the right here, the body weight on one side of the seesaw. And the other is that, that function of that uh, muscles that we talked about balancing those. And when those are balanced, that means the pelvis will be balanced. And the other part of it is it offers stability of the hip. So we have to make sure that we're putting the hip in a position to balance it so it stays stable throughout the, the, the length of it. And then also that it is, we, we're not applying too much force through the hip replacement to affect the surrounding tissues and the surrounding bone. So some things that we talk about, um, not everybody is a candidate for surgery or not everybody has progressed to the level of needing a surgery. So things that we commonly do uh, that are non-operative is we'll talk about weight loss if, it, if it's a possibility. So weight loss, why does that work well? Is we think of that seesaw, if we put less weight on one side, that means that muscle doesn't have to work as hard on the other side. Thus, the force across the hip is a little bit less. And But, you know, weight loss is a, is a difficult topic, and um, it, it's something that is, is there's no sure answers. And it's very difficult to have weight loss when your hip hurts or any other body hurts. And so th that's, that's a very understood part of uh, part of our medical treatment. The other thing is assistive devices. Sometimes we progress to a cane or, or a walker. A cane specifically is held in the other hand away from the hip that's affected, and it takes off some of the body weight. Uh, we talked about the limping. The limping causes less force, thus that muscle doesn't pull as much. Uh, certain people, this is a fancy term, but a coxivera is just the way that they're shaped, uh, the, sh the hip is shaped and that will cause less force across there. There's also things that we do during the surgery in terms of the positioning of the implant, implants that will cause less force across them, thus making them last longer. Um, we talk about optimization of the implants themselves. We also will talk about the optimization of the leg length and the offset, which I'll get into, and having a better understanding of how we wanna restore the patient's
natural anatomy before it became arthritic. Uh, there's a fancy formula we have for joint reactive forces. Uh, it's, you know, you'd have to go back to your geometry days of uh, cosine and, and uh, different angles and things like that. I always talk about uh, uh, Doc from Back to the Future. He would be the only one that would be able to figure out this formula. But again, it, it comes down simple to thinking about that seesaw. So we look at that hip replacement on this patient's right side. When we look in an x-ray, you're looking at it. Um, you know, it's, it, this is the patient's left where my arrow is. And then obviously the hip replacement, you can see that's, that's their right hip. And so we want that, that hip replacement to have the same force on one side as it does on the other. And that's what comes into the joint reactive forces. So we make sure that we optimize the lengths of the muscle, okay? And uh, like I said, it's not optimizing it to where you are possibly now, but where you were when that joint was healthy. And then also the length of the leg. So when you have arthritis or you lose cartilage, and sometimes it gets so erosive that you do start to lose some of the bone within the hip replace or the hip itself, that means the leg will shorten. And we'll show some x-rays later of how patients have had considerable shortening of their leg and the effect that that's had on them. And then being able to restore that is really important. Here's an example, just this is a, a picture of about that offset and the, the leg, um, the neck length or the length of the, the leg itself. If you look at this picture on our, our right, you can see the offset is from that center of that bone to that muscle that we talked about. And that's really important to make sure that we restore that offset or that length to make sure that that muscle is, is functioning at, at its most optimum level. And then also the length. And so if you change the muscle and you make it too long or you make it too short, it's not going to have the appropriate function. And it can also be painful for the patient postoperatively. Also, in, when, when you come in for an evaluation, we want to make sure that things are functioning appropriately. So we want to make sure that the muscles and ligaments and tendons around the hip are functioning. And if they're not for whatever reason, we want to make sure that we either optimize them before surgery or we give you an operation to lower your risk of complication afterwards. Things that we take into consideration uh, is stroke, patients with MS, Parkinson's, uh, possibly alcohol abuse and the, the, the propensity for falls with that. All those things are taken into consideration to make sure that we give you the best chance at an outcome. We also look at the patient's spine. Do they have issues with spinal stenosis or, or narrowing of the spinal canal? And what nerves has this affected? And have you lost motor function to certain parts of, of that leg uh, or upper leg? and what role that'll play in the hip replacement itself. The other things is the patient sustained any kind of trauma. Have they had radiation to the surrounding bone? Have they had tears? Have they had previous infections or the previous surgeries? All of those things play into the consideration to try to optimize the outcome. Approach is a common topic now. Um, it's uh, changed in terms of uh, what becomes more popular and what becomes uh, less popular in times, and it's changing to this day. Um, so I'll kind of go over the, the four main approaches that we have to the hip. The first approach is the anterior approach. Um, that's a common topic that we discuss now. So the an anterior approach goes through the front, um, and we spread the muscles apart, and we approach the, the hip from really around the, the, the front area. The other two side approaches, there's an anterior lateral approach, and then there's also a lateral approach. Um, and these are done more from the side of the hip. And then there's the, the most popular still is, is the posterior approach. And what I would have to say to this is, what is most important that we found and what improves the patient reported outcomes or how the patient feels is that the, the surgery was done well. And so I would say that Whatever approach that you have done, you want it done well. And that's the most important part of your, for your outcome. Uh, me personally, if, you, if you're younger and um, you, know, you have a traumatic accident where you, you break your hip in a way that we're gonna retain the bone, I'll do an anterior approach. 
Uh, if you're someone in those high-risk categories that we talked about for um, possible post-operative dislocations like a stroke or MS or Parkinson's, um, I think a lateral approach is, is sometimes better. And then uh, the standard or, or workhorse approach is going to be the posterior approach. Um, each approach has risk and it has benefit over the others. Um, and I think weighing those risks and benefits is, is very important. Hip replacement itself, what do we do? Uh, so we looked at that, we look at that pelvis, we remove about two to three millimeters of bone in that pelvis, and we put a cup very tightly into that area. Uh, and then we put a stem into the middle of the femur that you can see on your, your picture on the right. And those, that's the basics of the, of the hip replacement. And so what happens is the bone will grow into the implant commonly in the femur. It'll also grow into the bone, or I'm sorry, the bone will grow into the implant in the pelvis. And then what we usually touch is what we call the bearing surface. So how do we do that? We remove the top of the femur and we develop that acetabulum into a, a circle pattern. And those are where the implants go into. And you can kind of see how they go into here to give a to get a better idea. Um, on your picture on the left is that titanium cup going into that that bone, and then there's your liner that goes into that cup. And then um, on the picture on the right is the stem going into the femur, and you can see how eventually they will touch, and that's the bearing surface for the hip replacement. Here's another picture of it. So where have we come? Where what advances have we made over time? Um, we have an idea of how the body incorporates that implant. So titanium, why do we use titanium? There's two reasons. Bones actually move. So when we walk, they bend and they flex very, very minuscule amounts. But titanium matches that closer than any metal that we've had previously. And so we've gone over it almost exclusively to titanium implants for what we call press fit stems or stems that touch the bone directly. Um, these stems that are press fit offer biologic fixation, which I alluded to where the, the, the bone is actually growing into these porous surfaces on the stems themselves. They're, the, the way that they shaped are better than they ever have been. And why are they improved is we wanted to preserve the bone that you, you have now. Some of the older stems that we had, say, even 20 to 30 years ago, while they would be well fixed, they wouldn't stress the bone in a way, and patients would end up losing some of the bone on the proximal part or the or the top of the femur area and have you know significant complications from that. So it's really about finding that appropriate fixation while maintaining that anatomy. 20, 25, 30 years down the road after you've had your hip replaced. We look at this, the, the sizes, the, the, the implant themselves in terms of the pores or the, the porous surface, the, the how much por porosity do they have, the gap that we want between the bone and the implant, and then also the amount of motion that we're able to accept in those first six to eight weeks. I talk about bone growing into the implant, though that seems kind of weird, but if you, if you were, unfortunately, to break your arm and say we put it in a cast, it would take about six to eight we weeks to heal. And so what happens is blood will come into the area, that blood gets turned into cartilage, and that cartilage gets turned into bone. And that's exactly what happens in a hip replacement in these press fit designs is, is the bone is slowly growing over that first six to eight weeks of growing into that, that implant. Some patients, their bone isn't appropriate for the press fit and we will cement the implant in place. Um, this is all dictated by the quality of bone that is present. Sometimes patients suffer from osteoporosis, even osteopenia, where their bone quality is okay, but the amount of bone that they have is not enough for, for the implant for the press fit design, and the risk of putting that type of implant in is too great. Also, patients that have possibly had cancer, and so that body part has been, uh, has had radiation, that can affect the bone and the ability for it to grow into implants. And these are things that we take into consideration with planning. So in terms of 
my practice with most, I would say 90 to 95% of patients will receive a press fit stem, but we always in surgery have the availability for that cemented stem in case we find something that wasn't seen preoperatively, intraoperatively, it can be uh, corrected. In terms of the cement itself, we've, we've looked at a lot of different things and how we make the cement on the back table in terms of taking the air bubbles out of it. The size of the cement mantle that connects that bone to the implant, what, do, what size should it should be, and it should be uniform around there. We also don't use the titanium stems commonly in this, in this setting because we talked about that they bend a little bit more. Uh, and, and when I say bend, I mean less than a human hair. But a, uh, a stiff stem, like a stainless steel stem, doesn't bend as much. So it is able to be uh, or adhere to that cement better and, and the longevity will be better. And also the importance of positioning. I alluded to, to bearing surfaces earlier, and that's the part in your hip replacement that's touching. And so most common bearing surface uh, in today's joint replacement is going to be a polyethylene or plastic liner inside that titanium cup and a ceramic head. And there's been a lot of advancements specifically in the polyethylene. I think that's where we've seen our greatest uh, jump in, in technology over the last 10 years is we've been able to create a plastic that is gonna have longer longevity than what we used to. Um, and the reason we were able to do that is through different um, manufacturing techniques and, and melting of the plastic and um, forming it again, we've increased the, the, the wear rate. And so we're not seeing as many plastic particles that we used to. That used to be a significant problem that we would have to deal with. And, uh, the modern technology does, just doesn't demonstrate that, which is, which is excellent. And then the advancements in ceramic. So um, today's ceramic material is much more um, tough and it's less brittle than what we used to have. Um, some, some implants you'll hear are metal on metal, and we had really catastrophic problems with the, with the metal on metal. Uh, and it, at the time, we thought it was best because it's the best wear properties that you can get in terms of uh, the actual metal on metal um, will last forever. But what we didn't know is that over time it would shed metal into the patient's hip, very small particles that can have effects on the surrounding tissues. Um, there are certain implants, it's more of a hip resurfacing and not a hip replacement that this metal on metal for a variety of different reasons, and it's really a different operation, is still a very safe and, and appropriate operation in, in that setting. We've learned uh, and we understand the patient's anatomy better. So the pelvis, we've learned where to stay out of in terms of placements of screw fixation and also where retractors are placed and, and the risks that can be associated. So having your surgeon must have a, a great idea where those, those uh, nerve vascular or arteries and nerves and veins are and they, they have to have those uh, appreciation for them so no cause or no harm is, is caused during the surgery itself. Uh, basics of hip templating. So before your surgery, I'll go over your x-rays and we use uh, a program that we can actually use the size of the implants that we have, um, every millimeter different sizes. And I can see before the surgery, what best fits your anatomy in terms of both the cup and the femur. And we talked about restoring the leg length, restoring that offset, and also the size, because um, there, there are many different sizes of, of human beings. And so not every, one size does not fit all. Again, we talked about the leg length. Um, we use different landmarks during the surgery itself. We use the length of the femur, the length of the leg overall, and then the relationship to different surrounding parts of the bone when we're in surgery to make sure that that's within millimeters when we're done. And also again, that that muscle is optimized in terms of position where it's supposed to be. We found uh, ideal positions for the acetabulum or the cup portion. Um, lots of uh, research has gone into this. I'll allude to uh, some of the, the newer research that we have in terms of the relationship between the pelvis and the spine and the spine's role in that. 
But over time, we found that certain positions work better to allow more stability for that hip itself. That's what I talked to you about earlier, is making sure that the hip replacement is done appropriately. And it's it really comes down to the exposure and, and the approach to the hip, and then putting those implants in the correct position that's gonna give that longevity of the hip itself. Also the position of the femoral component and the angle that it's placed, the length that it's placed, and its relationship to the surrounding bone is, is very important to having a good outcome. Again, this is something we, we talked about in terms of the, the hip templating. And you can see that the, the femoral component, this is just what we'll, this is an example of what we can have. This is the femoral component here down in the, the femur or the, the, the multiple line blue. And then you can see the hemicircle up there. And, and what we're looking at are those red circles. So we know that those when those red circles, we want them to match up over time. And if they don't match up, they have to not match up for a reason. That means we're trying to make the leg longer or we're trying to, to push that hip out to the side. Four things that, that are really important to giving you a good outcome is the component design. So the implant that we're actually using, you wanna have a tried and true implant that's been around, um, that's had you know good outcomes. The positioning that those implants are put in, the soft tissue tension that's been reconstructed, and also the, the making sure that those areas are functioning appropriately before we leave the operating room. Implants it, it's themselves, we've looked at different sizes, and so that we allude to that bearing surface. Um, they, we used to use smaller sizes in terms of the femoral head, and what this would do is it would allow less wear. Well, the advantages of using a larger head is it's more stable. Uh, the, the implants won't touch each other or, or you won't have impingement increasing that risk of, of dislocation of the hip. And so with the advancement of the plastic, we are allowed to use larger heads. And so the, we're getting advantages of long wear also with the hip being more stable over time. We also look at the, the positioning and the size of the head there's a relationship that we have to make sure that when we cut that bone, we cut the appropriate amount because once it's gone, it's gone. You can't restore it. And so it has to be done at the, the appropriate length so we can reconstruct the hip to make sure that it's in the, that appropriate position. Uh, there's different ways that we use the actual liner or that plastic part that goes in the hip itself. There's different areas that we look at where we can raise it in certain areas to make sure that that joint replacement is more stable. Some patients have the ability to move their leg more than others. And sometimes this is an appropriate um, consideration in terms of the bearing surface that what's better for one patient might not be for the other and, and vice versa. Um, we talked about the positioning. So we look at both that positioning in, in many different ways. We look at it from, from the front and we look at the side. We also look at the rotation of the components and how they move. So when we do surgery, the implants will go in. Uh, at first we use what we call trials. So the trials will go in and once those trials are in there, I move the hip in positions that are common, you know, flexing greater than 90 degrees, uh, extending backwards and different types of rotation. And that hip has to be solid and has to be at the appropriate position uh, before we can close and be done with your operation. Something that's really interesting and that we've made a lot of advancements only in the last few years is we're starting to have an appreciation of the spine and its relationship to the pelvis. And, and when patients have problems with their lumbar spine, how that plays into their hip and, and vice versa. Um, and I'll show you some examples here. So what we look at is we look at the, with patients with lumbar history uh, or lumbar pathology, is we look at how this, the spine it moves. And so in terms of its stiffness and then the relationship that the pelvis has with that spine. And what we've seen is some patients with a stiff spine requires their, um, their hip joint to move more, okay? So that plays into the hip replacement uh, moving forward. So if we have a, a hip that's not, uh, or, or if a spine that's not moving as much and knowing that the hip is going to have to move more, that has to be taken into consideration during the surgery itself. And there's many different angles that we use to assess this. But this is, I think, the most telltale 
is you can see that that red line uh, of the sacrum and how it's positioned from being standing or standing to being seated, and then also the position that that pelvis moves. Um, this comes into play a lot also in the revision arthroplasty world, and that's when something has gone wrong with a hip replacement and a patient is seeing me because they've had complications and, and they're not happy with their outcome. And we'll a lot of times look at this to make sure that the spine and hip are, are moving appropriately. And you can see the difference here between when the patient is seated and when they're standing, the relationship at the hip joint is not, is not the same. And that's really important um, to take into consideration moving forward. Here's some examples of some x-rays. I'll, I'll briefly go through these, but this is a hip replacement. These are patients I've done within the last month. The left side here as we're looking um, is the good side. You see that ring of cartilage around. Obviously, they've had this, this right hip replacement. In arthritis, you get narrowing of the joint. You get extra bone around the joint. It becomes wider or sclerotic because it's being stressed in a different way. And um, you can see how the, the there's obviously an implant in there, but that position of the bone looks very nor normal in, in um, compared to the other side is, is where it's supposed to be. This is a very interesting and unfortunate case is that the, this gentleman lost the blood supply to his femoral head. And you can see that that blue line, when I intersect his pelvis, no matter where the pelvis moves, the hip have to move with it because they're attached there. And you can see how much shortening this gentleman had on it on his right leg. And, and we were able to restore that and it was amazing over time as he was able to recover, he thought he'd never be able to walk normal again because over years, his body had started to adjust to this, this short leg. And, and in two hours, we were able to correct that. Now he took a, a considerable uh, task himself in terms of the physical therapy, but he really had a, a nice outcome with this. And everybody has a hip replacement for a different reason. Um, this lady un unfortunately sustained a car accident. She was very young and um, she had her she had her hip fixed, and unfortunately the blood supply was was disrupted at the time of her injury, and they uh, were not able to restore it um, at the time of her surgery. And so she went on to need a, a hip replacement. And obviously this is a very different and many different considerations from a patient that's had uh, arthritis and something that's been long standing. This was about a two to three month turnover of um, you know a 30 something year old lady is, is doing well, a car accident, and then uh, she's having someone tell her that she needs a hip replacement. That's, that's very traumatic to the patient, but taking those considerations in the, in the play and uh, she's doing well uh, in the post-operative period. This is a lady that came to me from uh, Indiana. Um, un unfortunately, she just missed the polio vaccine when it came out. And so she had a significant polio effect to her, to her right leg. And her considerations, as you can see, the morphology are, are just how those two femurs are different and, and how that leg was, was different in all the considerations, including her lumbar hardware that you can see on that picture on the left, taking all those things into consideration. She's having a nice outcome and, and amazed at, at the difference in, in what she's been dealing with for a long time. The last patient is a, a very considerable and advanced case of arthritis. As you can see on the hip on the right and the, le the left, they look very different. The left hip is, is an, a, a very advanced arthritis, but even the right is even greater. You can see how the pelvis has been completely eroded and it's a very large hole that she's created. She was uh, very medically sick for a long period of time and she was able to recover and she, she was never during the time being able to have a hip replacement. And so when it was advanced to a significant stage, it required a different type of hip replacement. And so a, the, the hip replacement and then augmenting or, or adding metal to recreate her bone that was surrounding to get her a good outcome. And so over about a year period, we were able to get her two hip replacements and she came into the office initially in a wheelchair and she's not walking like she was 20 years ago, but she's walking and it, it's really encouraging. And what I alluded to before was pain is one thing, but the the function that she has in her daily life has has exponentially gotten gotten better, and she's she's very happy with where she's at because of that. Other things that we take into consideration is just that preoperative workup in terms of your history history and physical and getting to know you during that visit.
to see how we can optimize your outcome. Uh, things that are modifiable, smoking, uh, possible diabetes, making sure that your lab work is appropriate for, before we undergo this big operation. Uh, we have joint education classes that you can go to, have a better understanding of how to prepare yourself and your home uh, for time after surgery. Pain control is significantly improved. It's not a painless operation by any means, but the pain control is significantly better by medications that we give you before surgery, during surgery, and afterwards. Things that we do to, to lower your risk of infection, blood clots, um, and then how we administer physical therapy. Ideally, patients recover best when they're at home and physical therapy is able to come to their house. That's not for everybody, but the vast majority of the patients are able to do that and it, it's a great way to recover. And then also we give you some ways to move after surgery. They usually last for about three months in terms of not stressing in terms of one way or another, but eventually they, they do go away.